recording. And uh, I asked Brother Michael Smith to sing a song to get us started this morning. <laughs> I want to worship the Lord with all Give him and not just I want to lift up my hands to the King of Kings. And everything I want to worship the Lord with all we can see. They can see us. If you and I just want to lift up. I had a drink this Sugar? the sugar? And These are big. I want to lift up my hands to the King of Kings and praise Him in Let's, uh, Brother Michael, let everybody turn your microphone on and let's. Let's sing that chorus one time through. Let's see what it sounds like. Let everybody see. I'm just wondering if it's possible. I want to worship. <laughs> So the late actually going on there. Thank yeah, you. I don't think that works too good. I was wondering about that because we had, you know, I've seen some Zoom meetings where course it you know like i've seen the band play and i've seen churches you know that actually have the band together to play for a zoom meeting that works okay because they're all right there but i think everybody on different wi-fi's it even your singing was broken some for me i don't know was it for other people yeah so uh i, I just thought we'd try that uh, I, I would, uh, I want to see if someone would like to testify, someone would like to comment or if they have something they want to say, uh, I'd like for us to be able to interact here a little bit. I'm trying. Good morning. Good morning. This sister Nona, let me try and get my face up here somehow. But I appreciate God for his goodness and his mercy. I appreciate God for his protection and covering over me. On uh, Thursday morning, I was going to work and um, I don't know who it was, but they were getting ready to run into the back of my car and hit me from the back of my car. 
and God just moved me over out of the way of danger. It's more to it, but I'm just telling that portion that how God spared me on a Thursday morning. And I appreciate God for that this morning. And I just want the saints to know that I love them and I appreciate God. Praise the Lord. All right, maybe somebody else has something they want to say or a test, give a testimony here. I did one day last week. Sister Holly, you're you're not muted, so was you wanting to testify or say something? Oh, I thought I was muted. <laughs> but no. I will tell something. I will say something that happened to me this week. I okay. lost one of my hearing aids at work. I could not find it. Me and a couple other co-workers looked everywhere, could not find that hearing aid. And they mine are not cheap. They're Bluetooth connection and um I thought, well, the next day I came, when I woke up the next morning, the thought that was on my mind when I woke up was, how, how stupid am I? I could have tracked my hearing aid with my phone, and I forgot that I could do that. Well, the hearing aid was dead, so when those, I still couldn't find it. So the, the, the next morning, coworkers and I were talking, and one of them made a comment. She said, well, Holly, your hearing aid would match our furniture if it was just hanging over, hanging on it, you probably wouldn't be able to see it. So whenever she made that comment, I went back into a room that we keep supplies because I had put some supplies up the next the day before. And I thought, let me open that chair up completely and see if maybe it got hung underneath it in some of the railing stuff. Anyway, because I had looked under the chair the day before and found some paper that had gotten overlooked and I threw that away. So I opened the chair and I was looking all underneath it and I got down on my hands and knees where I could really look in there. And there that hearing aid was on my on the floor. And I thought, thank you, Lord. I am so undeserving of you doing that for me. And I went and told the people, everyone that was working, that works back in the area with me, they just could not believe that I had found it. And I said, God's good. I said, I don't know why he's good to me. I said, but he is good to me sometimes. And um, so I just want to say thanks that, you know, it, it probably is not very big to others, but it was like $3,000 big to me. <laughs> and I want to say I'm thankful for that. Yes, amen. All right, it's open for anyone else. Brother Smith, yes. um, along that same line for Sister that Sister Holly was talking about <clears throat> last a week ago Thursday uh, or Friday I guess Gladys called me and we couldn't find Lila's kitty cat and uh, we live out in the country so you know it could have been in a barn or or in the neighbor's cow pasture there's a number of places it could have wandered off to but I usually when we lose something I always remind my family that God knows exactly where it's at that there's nothing hidden from him and we should stop and pray and ask the Lord to show us you know we don't always know sometimes we lose something we never find it but in this particular case we got a phone call on Friday afternoon that that, that cat had hitched a ride on UPS all the way to Dallas Texas and of course it was just it was just an unbelievable story to hear and it's not really one I could tell on zoom but to, to hear how that happened and and uh, the fact that the cat was safe and we ended up going to Mesquite Saturday a week ago Saturday and picking the kitty uh, cat up at the, uh, the animal shelter the Mesquite animal shelter and bringing her back home 
but God knows if you lose something, God knows exactly where it's at, and we can always take time to pray. Yes. Hey, this is Hannah. I don't know if you guys can hear me. My phone's kind of dying. Yes, we hear you. Good and clear. Oh, okay, good. Um, so I just wanted to share, well, kind of, it's like a testimony, I guess, slash prayer request. Um, Caleb's uh, grandpa, his grandpa, Stuart, he's, you know, 90. And he, you know, he's older, but um, he's very well aware of his surroundings. And he's just... I don't know. He's got all this stuff together. And one day he woke up and decided he wasn't feeling good. So he like called an ambulance to come get him. He was totally chill about it. <laughs> uh, took him to the VA as a veteran and he ended up testing uh, positive for COVID. Um, and we were real worried and scared for him because of his age and he has other health problems. And his uh, wife, Ellen, was really upset too. But um so at the hospitals, it's so bad right now. You can't get in. There's no visitors. And he's a very anxious person too. Um, he's known to have like, I guess, anxiety attacks and stuff. So he was really upset about that. And I was just kind of thinking like, you know, what are we going to do? Like to kind of keep an eye on him. And then it hit me um, at the VA, my class that I graduated with a couple of years ago. Um, there's nine of us and only two. So we're kind of spread out all throughout the state. Like we have jobs at different hospitals. Well, there's two of them that end up at the VA and I was thinking like, oh, you know, what are the odds? And they're like actually close friends of mine that I keep in contact to this day. And, and the VA has like 15 uh, respiratory therapists at the hospital per shift. So I was like, you know, you just never know. And end up, he had them every night he was there, those two classmates, like every night. And I, it was like, uh, I want to say it was like four or five nights he was there and he like I was able to communicate with him and just to keep tabs on him and then you know Caleb's family was kind of able to communicate with him that way kind of help ease his mind and also um Caleb's grandma Ellen Stewart it made her feel you could tell like she just felt so much better but anyway he ended up they discharged him he's doing good just remember him in your prayers because he has very very severe CHF congestive heart failure and um he will be dealing you know with the COVID after effects, but he, as of now, is doing pretty good. But I just want to share that. All right, good. Hey, Dad, I, I yes. just wanted, I just wanted to, just this just now got posted on Facebook from Shane Clifford's wife. Uh, a lot happened last night. His blood pressure got really low, and they found he had some bleeding in his chest. They did an interventional radiology procedure to stop the bleeding. It didn't work. And the angiogra uh, angiography showed diffuse bleeding and nothing can be fixed. He's got 20 units of blood so far, along with other blood products. He continues to have bleeding. They're trying IV medication to help with the clotting. The outlook is grim. So they appreciate our pair of prayers, they said. Yes. I, I 43 years old with, with two young children. Yes. I, that is uh, Sister Gail's uh, nephew, isn't it, or cousin? cousin. Which one is it? Cousin. Yeah, cousin. Yes. And so, <clears throat> yeah, we got that information this morning, and we certainly do want to keep him in our prayers and the family, too. Uh, maybe we just go ahead right here and pray. Um, Brother and Sister Weaver, actually, uh, Ray Weaver, we're planning on coming to church today. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we, we had uh, all the Durham families out uh, with either COVID or being exposed to COVID. And uh, then the McGowan family also is out. And then Brother Painter, I think he said he sent five people home with COVID from work and he and Neth and I were exposed. So that put them out. And then uh, brother Keith Dodson had, has, has COVID. Anyway, there's several people that were, were exposed. So I just felt like we might as well. And we had had work day um, so 
planned, but there just wasn't enough that could work. And so, uh, Brother Scott York is, he's been, I've had him down at the church all week. He's got the entire dining room painted. And um, we're, we're still got to work on uh, getting the freezers put in the freezer room. He's got it painted and base, base put around on it. So the freezers be ready to put back in there. But we just didn't hardly have, we didn't have anybody that could work with him yesterday other than Brother Mark and Brother Ethan went down there and helped him get some things put in the dumpster because they're going to pick it up Monday morning. So we are going to have another work day Saturday, but um, we're going to try to get what we've done, get done this week so that it'll be ready to put tables and chairs back in the dining room and take all the stuff that we put in the Tucker and Leonard, Leninger room back in there. So that's just a little bit of report that, that we do have all the tile down, replaced. And uh, while we've got everything out of there, we're, we're, we went ahead and painted it. And so <clears throat> it's looking good, but, um, and hopefully we won't have to have any more of these Zoom meetings. Uh, I hope we don't have to have any more for Sunday especially, and uh, I don't know where we're at on, on weeknight services. We just wait and see what happens as COVID still spiked, but they say it's diminishing and I hope they're right. I, a lot of the experts are saying that they think this Omicron strain will be maybe the last strain of the pandemic and it'll go into an endemic um, and that COVID, as far as the pandemic is concerned and it being so dangerous that it's, we're going to be pretty much behind us. And I hope that, I hope they're right about that. I'm ready to get back to normal, <clears throat> whatever that is. I'm not sure what normal is anymore. Anyway, um, let's pray for brother Shane, uh, and then Brother Lewis's grandson, we want to keep him in mind. Brother Goss, the family and the church in Keswick. Uh, I think they're having probably a, a meeting right now. Some of them click on, you know, later. Uh, I noticed um, on Sundays. They're always there on Thursday nights. But then... Um, Keep praying for Brother Ray and Susan Weaver and Brother, uh, those that who do have COVID, Brother Dodson, I think Brother Matthew Durham is about over his, but let's keep him in our prayers. Um, um, let's see. Um, trying to think of who. Oh, brother D.L. Jones, brother D.L. Jones, he is back home and he is improving. He had COVID and was in the hospital, but he's home taking uh, therapy, I think, and home care there at home. So, Noni, you wanting to say something? Uh, yes, uh, Sister Donna and Ann's mother needs prayer. Yes. They need prayer. They're home, uh, home health, so they need prayer as well. Yes, Sister Donna Henderson and her mom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Um, Dylan has a heart procedure coming up. Oh, and, and Dillard, her son has a uh -huh. hard uh, procedure coming up and he needs prayer. Okay. Brother Dylan, remember him. Uh, yeah. We've got a doctor's appointment tomorrow that we will be determining uh, about, some, about prostate surgery. So appreciate your prayers about that. Um, 
I don't have prostate cancer. I just have enlarged prostate. And, and uh, they think they can help me quite a bit. So I'm gonna, we're going to go discuss that tomorrow. Um, somebody help me. We've got another prayer request. And oh, the, oh the, the McGowans are not sick. Their granddaughter lives with them, did test positive for COVID. I don't know that they're even on here. I don't know. But um, anyway, so uh, let's remember them because we don't want them to get sick at their age for sure. Yes. And Sister Ann, she said her daughter's family has COVID. They need prayer. Okay. Sister Ann's daughter's family. Yeah. Uh, that reminds me, somebody sent me a somebody sent me a text that their family had COVID. I was trying to think who that was. Wasn't in the church though, I don't think. So come to me, I'll remind you. Is there any other prayer request that uh, we need to mention here? Please continue to pray for uh, my father-in-law, Willie Denman. Okay, Brother Denman, yes. All right, let's all unmute our phones and pray together about these needs. And ask God to give us a help, some help. Praise God. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Watch over the people in appreciate you Oh, oh God, Jesus, 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 we love you today, and we're thankful for your goodness. Amen, amen. All right. Uh, before we started, we were uh, talking a little bit. Brother Painter was reminding me that uh, about you know we we've been talking a little bit about. Agape love and filial love. Um, and about probably the best uh, definition that I can uh, come up with is that agape love, uh, it's, I would, I guess the best way I can define it is it's it's the uh, sentiment of your heart of what you really have a, have complete sentiment or affection towards. Um, it's a it it's a higher love than filial love. Filial love is friendship love. It's it's. Uh, it's used more as in affectionate towards a friend, uh, but the love of God is as agape love. But that word is also used as uh, your affection for anything. Even the Old Testament Hebrew word that the Greek word agape uh, is akin to or taken from in the interpretation is <clears throat> uh, 
the, the sentiment of your affection for anything. And in fact, it's in, in, in Hebrew, it's used as lust, even. That's something that you have a great desire for, you know, your whole sentiments toward where Philo is used more for, like I said, friendship. Um, there are, when you go back to the, uh, to John 21, where Jesus, you know, after he resurrected from the dead and asked if, uh, when he asked, you know, he, the, the, the disciples had, Peter said, I'm going fishing. They all said, we'll go too. Seemed like he was, you know, he was the influence over the group. Whatever Peter did, they all followed. And uh, they were fishing. Jesus appeared after he had resurrected and, and told them to fish on the other side of the boat. And they did and had a great catch. And anyway, they came ashore. Jesus uh, Peter jumped out of the boat, I think, and and I, don't, I guess he swam ashore. Uh, but anyway, they came ashore and they were eating fish uh, together. And Jesus asked, asked Peter, said, Peter, lovest thou me? That word lovest is agape. That, that's that, you know, do you love me? Now, I will tell you, I've done quite a bit of study on that. There's some theologians that thinks that there's that agapeo and phileo is used um, synonymously. That you know, it's just used. It can be used either way. Uh, I go through all the different scriptures in the Bible, but I don't think you'll ever find God's love as being. Philo Jesus, you know, shows that at times. But you'll, if you study it out, you'll see that agape love is, is a superior love than Philo. And then in this rendition or this, this uh, account of Jesus, Jesus asking Peter three times if he loved him. And you have to remember, Peter had just before Jesus, when they took Jesus, Peter denied him three times. Uh, no doubt in fear of his own life that he, and Jesus asked him three times back. And every, when Jesus asked him the question, do you love me with agape love? Peter answered every time. Lord, you know, I love you with filial love or friendship love. I don't think the distinction would have made, been made between the two loves. Uh, if there's not a point here that, that uh, uh, it's like Jesus was, was addressing him because of, you know, him telling the Lord, I'll never... I'll never forsake you, or I'll, I'll never deny you. And Jesus said, you'll deny me three times before the cock crows tonight. Um, the other disciples, bro, that's what Brother Painter was reminding us of, that it says that they answered in the same way. Uh, but because Peter was um, such a... Uh, influence and such a and, and let's see in in John you go to John 21 here um you know the first time Peter says Peter do you love me he says Lord um you know I love you Let's see how he said it. He said, and Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. That was filial love. What, what, when Jesus said, uh, and probably the, 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 in the, the interpreters probably didn't know how to interpret this. Were they saying the same thing? Or is there a distinction? So he just put it love. 
and you just have to figure it out. I guess this must have been their thought. Um, Jesus asked him, lovest thou me more than these? Well, that's a question. Is he saying, do you love me more than you love these fish since you've decided to go fishing? Or was he saying, do you love me more than you love these, than, than the disciples love me? Do you love me more than they do? Or, was you, or is he saying, do you love me more than you love these disciples? So there's a question there is that who these are. But nevertheless, the bottom line is, is do you have, do you love me with a, with the sentiment of the very, of your heart? You have that kind of agape love for me. And Jesus and Peter answered and said, you know, I love you, or you know, I'm your friend. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. And the second time he asked him again, lovest thou me? He, he, he was saying, do you have a goppy love for me? Do you, do you really love me with your whole being? He said, Lord, you know, I'm, I'm your friend. He used Philo again. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. And then Jesus, the third time, it seems very evident to me that the Lord is, is insinuating here, you denied me three times, just like I told you would. Now, I want to know, do you really love me with all your heart, with all your sentiment? And and here Peter's saying, Lord, you know I'm your friend, but he never would come back with agape love, the same love Jesus was asking of. The third time, when he, the third time Jesus said, Son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And that love is Philo. That time Jesus said, Peter, are you my friend? And Peter was grieved because he said the third time, lovest thou me? The third time he said it with, Peter, are you my friend? And he said unto him, Lord, you know all things. Thou knowest I love you or that I'm your friend. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Jesus, uh, I, I mean, uh, you have, there's some assumption has to take place here, but in my opinion, um, Peter's saying to the Lord, you know, I just got through denying you three times. I think it's obvious that I can't say that I love you as strong as I thought I did. You got to remember, Peter didn't have the Holy Ghost. He hadn't grown in, uh, you know, in the inner man yet. God, in fact, look at his very next statement. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee where thou wouldest not. Thus spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto him, follow me. Um, And then it says, uh, then Peter turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following. That was, that was, uh, and that's agape love there, that Jesus loved, that was John. Um, but it just looks like that Peter was coming to the realization that I really don't have, you know, I mean, I thought I had that agape love. I thought I really came to a place, you know, but you got to remember here, Peter thought when they, when they began to question him and one testified saying he is one of his disciples, that here he's feared for his life and, and he denies the Lord. And, uh, you know, 
you wonder about these things, how the Lord, how God showed, either God showed Jesus that Peter was going to deny him three times, or Jesus stated it and God made it happen. One or the other, it happened, just like Jesus said it would. But the point is, is that, um, you know, at least what I got out of it for me is that I've thought a lot of times about the martyrs that were martyred by the Catholic Church, you know, for their, their conviction and their state. And, uh, you know, I've wondered to myself, would I have, would I have martyred, would I have made that kind of commitment that those martyrs made? I've also wondered, was it really necessary for all of them? It, it was probably necessary as much as as they could understand what was necessary for them because that was their conviction. And if they gave up their conviction, they'd have felt like that they denied the Lord. But I've asked myself, you know, in my mind, I thought, well, you know, I mean, I, have, I mean, I've actually thought this. Is I thought, well, you know, if you just said, if you just agreed with them, you'd get to live and maybe they'd leave you alone um, and uh, you'd escape death. On the other hand, if you kept your convictions, you'd be found out eventually anyway. So you wonder, you know, where, where would you be in a situation like that? I mean, there's people that, that died at an early age, you know, because of their convictions in God. And, uh, you know, you, you, can't, you can't hardly judge the Lord's servants. You can't judge his people. We don't know what was in their hearts and in their minds. Only God knows that. That's why only he is able to judge righteously. Because we, you know, somebody may have done wrong yesterday, but they may have really repented with a repentant, true repentance, and God forgave them, and we're still holding them in judgment, and God's not. So, you know, to uh, we just have to put some things in God's hands. But I made this statement the other day. I said, I hope that I can love the Lord more than just filial love. I hope that I can, I hope my whole sentiment, uh, and then this word, let me say this too while I'm here, is agape love is used in the Bible even by sinners, you know, or uh, concerning their love or their desire and lust for things in the world. So, you know, I, I think you gotta understand the difference between agape love and filial love. Again, I'm, I right now my best, the best definition I've been able to come up with in my mind is that it is the very center sentiment of your heart towards whatever you love. Really, uh, I, I guess you you might even could put it like a parent love for their child. I think almost any parent would, you know, that has the right spirit, would die for their children. I mean, I know, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I mean, I've never put, been put to that test, but I know how much I love uh, Michael, and I know if, if I would take his place or my wife's place, uh, if, if I could spare their life. I mean, that's the way I've always felt, and I don't, I don't see no backup in me about that. But, and so that to me would have to be a doppy love. But like Brother Bud and I, we were actually closer to one another than either one of us were to our own natural siblings. I was probably that close with my cousin, Joe's, Bill Sutmiller too. Bill's, Joe's brother, his oldest brother, Bill Sutmiller and I, we were very, very close. And to me, that's filial love. We, 
you know, I, I love Brother Bud with filial love, but he wasn't, I didn't have that blood, you know, but I actually, I'll be honest with you, I was closer to him than I were in either one of my brothers. Very close. But I don't know that it was agape love, you know. <laughs> I mean, don't ask me the question now if I'm going to lay down my life for, for Brother Bud. He's, he's not here for me to have to make that decision, but but we are supposed to love our brothers as ourselves. And so our, our neighbor, you know what Jesus said, to love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, and all your might, and, uh, uh, to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus gave a, a little parable about that. And he said, if a, if a person was wounded on the side of the road, and in despair, and here come a here come a priest walking along, and he sees him, and so he moves over to the other side of the road and walks on past. Him. Then the next guy is uh, a Levite, I believe that's what he said, and he said uh, he walked on past him. And the next guy is a Samaritan. Jesus, he was really. Uh, keen about how he used things. The Samaritan wasn't even, you know, Jesus told the little Samaritan lady at the well, he said, you don't even know what you believe in. We know what we believe in. We, we that are of Judah, uh, and it, but, but those of you that are of Samaria have completely lost out with the understanding of God's purpose and word. But so he used that. He said, here comes a Samaritan he sees this guy's condition, and so he goes over to him and helps him and dresses his wounds and takes him home with him. And the next morning, he he, he leaves him with in somebody else's care and gives him money to take care of him. Says if he needs anything else, put it up to my charge, and I'll pay you next time I'm going through here. All right. And then he asks the guy, which one of the which one of these love us? loved the most um and of course the answer was the one that gave the help and he said you answered right and so <clears throat> uh anyway that to me is it's uh it, you know something that i've just recently really looked into and studied out more than I've ever studied it out. And um, there are opinions in the Bible that, you know, that, 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 that this account, them two loves don't mean anything. They just, they just used them at random, but I, it's too emphatic to me. I, I don't see it that way. And neither does other theologians, but there are some that don't. I mean, I've read three different renditions about it. Anyway, it's just, you know, uh, I was using here recently the, the fact that in, in, in first Peter, uh, where Peter said to add to, uh, virtue, knowledge, temperance, and patience, and then to add, to, to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, which is filial love, and then to brotherly kindness, charity. Uh, and that's agape love. And so the distinction, Peter makes a distinction between the two and shows that there's, there's two different kinds of loves you need to add spiritual. These are, these are spiritual loves uh, concerning the inner man. And uh, I made the statement that charity, you know, y'all know how I've used that where I've showed knowledge, temperance, and patience as being achieved in the labor, in the Pentecostal movement, which Brother Souders was a center of, uh, of what God was going to accomplish in the Pentecostal movement and bringing about this body. But then he's saying, add to your patience, 
godliness, God likeness. And I've, all, I've used that showing a picture of the tabernacle that once the priest clean, cleans it, you know, washes himself in the labor, then he has to change garments from a woolen garment to a linen garment, which represents the righteousness of the saints. And I've used that that garment there is we we come out of uh, Pentecost, and the body of Christ is reaches a place where they've become godlike in their character, in the inner man, as they've developed, as God's developed and caused us to develop in a, a higher calling, and then to add brotherly kindness to that. Brother Linegar taught us that there's four principles. Faith is your first principle that you've got to, you have to get that, the virtue of faith in your life to even enter into the kingdom of heaven. That's the gate. But then uh, humility. Uh, that, and that's the altar the brazen altar, but when you really put your life on the altar to, to, for God to let you, uh, you know, for, for the Lord to, uh, you know, it, it's going to take a certain humility that God puts on you and God causes you to, to attain for you to really uh, give your life as a sacrifice. To, I'm going to do your will, Lord. I'm going to obey you, and I'm going to leave the consequences up to you. Whatever my obedient to you is, that, you know, whatever consequence comes out of it, I'm leaving that up to you, but I, I'm going to keep obeying you. I'm going to keep following you. I'm going to do my best to serve you. And, um, that's the second principle is humility, faith and humility. Then the, the labor is the fear of God. We have got to get to a place where when we come to knowledge and we're tempered in that knowledge, and then that knowledge begins to work patience in our life where we wait on the Lord. And I'm saying wait by serving. I'm saying serving him with a fear that, you know, not, not only just an awe or a reverence, uh, but that, uh, that we actually are fearful that we would, uh, of God's, the uh, purity of the word of God, and that we uh, fear God's judgment until we can feel like that we've achieved a place really of patience where we finally have developed a place where we're resting in God. That's, uh, you know, the, the uh, circumcision in the Old Testament was a picture of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It's also a picture of the Sabbath, the Sabbath, the day of rest that we have got to enter in to rest and quit doing our own works and, and serving our own uh, ideology, but that we've learned God, enough of God's knowledge and understand him well enough where uh, we've, we've grown to a place where we're resting in him. We have patience. That was a question yesterday, and the minute with the ministers had a Zoom meeting yesterday, and I guess the theme of the meeting was, you know, um, seemed like it it what it wound up being more talked about was what brother brother uh, Adams in Benton Harbor he asked the question, "What are we lacking?" and if we know what we're lacking, then we set our hearts to it and, and begin to achieve it. Well, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's a question that we've had for many years now. We keep having men saying, well, if we, 
you know, can we make perfection now? Is it available? If it's not, what do we, what are we lacking? Well, the answer to that is, is that that we can't, we, the only answer there is to it is, is we're lacking whatever it is that God hadn't showed us what we don't have. And we've got to be, we still, we have to be, all we can do is serve him to the best of our ability and let him develop us in finishing the work. If we knew, if I could tell you, if I could say, look down there, you see that ribbon going across the road? That's the end of your race. <laughs> but I can't tell you that because I don't, God's working something different in every one of us. And therefore, I don't know the end of your race. I don't even know the end of mine. I can't, I don't, I don't see a ribbon. I don't see the end of the road. I don't know where the end of my, I, I may, I may, uh, I will say this. Here's something you have to understand about perfection. You are not going to be, uh, I mean, you need to be serving God to the best of your ability with a true commitment every day. If you do that, I think you'll make the bride. I think you'll, I think you'll be justified for either a resurrection of the just or uh, to be in the, the, uh, in the ruling and reigning group. However, you do need to consider this, and, and it seems like in the, in the Bible, in the New Testament, that, that what, we're, what the early church was striving for and what we're to be striving for is the, the makeup of the bride. But after the bride's made up, there's a whole millennial or thousand-year world that have the same qualifications of overcoming sin, same qualifications as those in the bride. Um, you know, and so, so I, I, I don't want, I don't think we're to look at that like, you know, well, I can either overcome now or I'll overcome later. Well, I, I think if you're unjust, your chances of overcoming are a lot less than if you stay just. So, you know, I, I, I feel like we all are to, we're justified by faith and you need to stay just before God and serve God. If you're not doing that, how you know you would do it ever? If you're putting it off for another day, how do you know you'd ever do it? If you can't do it now and there's no, and, Right now, there's no there's no reason you can't serve God and you can't get dedicated with this understanding that I can't even do that without God's help. I can't even get saved if God don't lead me into salvation. <clears throat> so if you're hungry, there's one of those Matthew five, six, and seven. Matthew five, one of the one of the beatitudes is. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Well, it looks to me like God even has to help you, help even make you hungry. Sometimes I pray that way. I say, God, make me hungry. <laughs> you know, help me to be hungry. Uh, you know, because I don't. You know, but if you if you if you can develop a hunger for the things of God, and if God will help you with it. Um, then you you're you know then then you, God is working in your life, and uh, you can be justified by by ser see, ser searching for uh, the things of God and hungering for the things of God. Uh, going back to brotherly love and charity. What I had I'd said on one of the Zoom meetings was is that we won't be perfected in charity until we get into the holy place because I've used that add to 
your patience, godliness, add to godliness, brotherly kindness. And I've made that the that garment change from the woolen garment that the priest had to change from in the outer court to the linen garment, which represent righteousness. Now he's, you know, godlike. We, you become godlike, uh, and you'll have brotherly kindness. And then add to brotherly kindness charity, which to me, the garment change is still out in the court, but when you enter into charity, that's in the holy place. Well, one of the brothers, you know, took it that I said, you can't even have charity to get in the holy place. You, you can't have it now. That I, what I was saying was you can't be perfected in it. You have a measure of faith now. You've got a measure of humility now. By the way, uh, and, and then the fear of God in the in the labor, you've got, uh, and I think you can be established in those things and even in God-likeness, godliness, and patience if God's developed you to that part, that point. I think you can have a measure of charity. I'm talking about the love of God that, that Jesus was talking to Peter about that, um, that um, in other words, God's helped me to develop agape love or the very sentiment of my the affection of my heart towards God, my brother. You know, it just seems to me that why would Peter ask you to develop brotherly love, brotherly kindness before we ask you to develop charity if that's not a step prior to charity? Now, godliness and brotherly kindness and charity is that's honor that was the four principles brother Leninger was saying we need to develop was faith um, humility the fear of God and honor and he was saying how can you honor God how do you love God who you've not seen if you love not your brother who you have seen so the uh, to really get to a place where you can honor one of the things I got from uh, and I'll say this here to y'all from Brother Don Patton in Fort Worth, Texas, is that he always could find a way to honor uh, even the least of people. He always, when he dealt with Babylon, he would show some kind of honor for those men that were serving God and trying to do what their heart, what they felt in their heart to do for the work of God, even though they weren't aware that they were in Babylon, he still would find a way to honor them. And I, that always impressed me that, you know, just like Jesus, Jesus recognized that Judas, you know, in Psalms, he said, uh, he called him a man uh, who is his own friend, his guide. He, he, he recognized and honored Judas, even though he knew he was a devil from the beginning, but he still found something in Judas's life. And I guess he understood, I don't know how long it may have took him to come to the full realization that Judas was chosen by his father to deceive him, to, to uh, betray him. And, uh, and then he was tested to have the same kind of love for his enemy. That's, you know, that was one of his teachings, love your enemies, uh, do good to them. <laughs> uh, you know, so, uh, uh, so to have the, you know, the, the honor, to develop a place of honor for, that's why, you know, we can't, you know, one of the things they talked about some yesterday on the Zoom meeting 
was, you know, one of the brothers was saying, talking about disfellowship and people that had done wrong. He said, y'all go ahead and disfellowship on my calling this to try to save them. <laughs> and another brother was saying, if we can't take workers of iniquity that's destroying people's lives and destroying churches and all of this, you know, uh, what, you know, then we're just going to have a, we're just going to have, you know, all kind of chaos among us if we can't have enough backbone to stand up for righteousness. So they kind of, you know, hit uh, an impasse right there. It sounded like, but I think if you talk to both of them, you'd probably find out that they've got some uh, opposite feelings from what their words sounded like. Because, you know, even though I've had people you know, right here in this church works gross iniquity against me. Uh, but, you know, if those people showed the right spirit and humility towards God, wouldn't you want God to save them and help them? And wouldn't we want to forgive them? And, you know, I, I do think we need, we do need to uh, hold us, a, 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 an order in God. We need to be strong enough to be orderly and not, not let chaos and iniquity just work, you know, and let wolves come in and destroy a sheep. But at the same time, if a wolf turns into a sheep, then we are to bring them back in the fold, don't you think? And so we got to have a heart. We got to have a heart that we're willing. We're forgiven. We've got a, a forgiveness and honor for anyone that God's able, if God deals with them and they, they turn, make a turn, um, you know, that's the way Brother Pryor, Brother Jeff Pryor was. Brother Jeff Pryor, when they first came into the church, he came in here and him and Sister Jody worked. And then Brother Pryor began to work iniquity and got in the wrong spirit. And they left. But then he came back to me and repented. He repented right, showed a true brokenness, and asked me if he could come back. I said, I, if you're going to come back, you need to get up and repent to the church. He did that. He came back, sat in the congregation, repented to the church. Uh, but you'd have to understand Brother Pryor's background, his history. Uh, to understand a little bit about why he's like he is. But anyway, he came back for a good long time. But Brother Pryor quit this church because, because he found out he wasn't going to be the next pastor. He found out that when he realized I wasn't going to put him in as pastor, and I don't know how he got the idea. I never one time ever had it in my mind. I, I watched him, you know, and considered, prayed, and asked God. But when he realized I wasn't going to put him in as a pastor, he quit again. And, uh, you know, so, it, but you got to understand, you know, uh, uh, the, he's God's child. Let God deal with him. Maybe the Lord will help him. Whether he got back in here or not, uh, I'd like to see him saved, wouldn't y'all? Wouldn't y'all like to see him back in the body of Christ and saved? Sure we would. Uh, you know, and so uh, it's just how we, we, we handle these situations, but we've got to have, we do have to come to a place of honor. How are you going to love God who you haven't seen if you love not your brother who you have? And so... <clears throat> God help us to develop where we've got the proper balance. You know, one of the things, love, just like God, God has judgment in love because he wants to save us. And we have to be the same way. We've got to, we got to love, you got to love your child enough to discipline that child. If you don't love that child, don't discipline that child right, you're, you're, you're going to cause that child to be lost. That child's got to know how to come under authority. That child's got to be able to accept chastisement. That child has to understand there's authority that they've got to submit to. 
and and it's the same way in the kingdom of God. There has to be an order, and there has to be a proper uh, a proper order with the right kind of mercy and grace that goes along with it. And uh, because all chastisement in the Lord is to bring us to a place of righteousness. So we don't want to chastise somebody for the purpose of getting rid of them or killing them, you know, uh, at least killing their, their uh, uh, ability to, to go on with God. But sometimes you may have to cut them off until God deals with them. And uh, when God does that, well, we ought to be like the prodigal son's father. We ought to run towards them if they want to come home. If they've if God got them in a condition where they decide to come home and be a servant, you know. Anyway, uh, I didn't even really mean to talk about the love of God, agape love and phileo, but I think it's good for us to consider. It's not something you hear talked about. I don't know that I've ever heard it talked about in the body. I mean, I've heard phileo and agape, but I've not ever heard anybody go into it this much to this extent. So I think it's something to, for us to consider. And, uh, I, you know, when I look at Peter's situation there, it looks like to me that the Lord was, was telling him, you know, Peter, you're, when you're young, you've girded yourself and went where you wanted to, but I'm, but there's something when you get old, you know, you keep serving me and you'll develop into a place that you'll actually, he was talking about what death he would, you know, Peter, of course, was martyred. And, and uh, when you're old uh, and you'll stretch forth your hands and another observes you and carry you where you wouldn't go right now. He wouldn't go. He wouldn't not deny the Lord when it looked like his life depended upon it. But I'm sure Peter developed that agape love for the Lord uh, and was perfected in that. Brother Smith, mm -hmm. in that particular passage there in John 21, 18, mm -hmm. is that a, a good illustration of meekness? Yeah, for sure. It may even be it may be almost the strongest sense uh, of weakness, of meekness that you know that you would yield to the Lord uh, uh, for others' sakes, not only for your own sake, but that you, you get to a place where you want to do the Lord's will so much you're yielding to Him, but in Peter's case, he was even yielding to others to a point that he would die for his brothers. He'd die for others for the gospel's sake to be planted in their lives. So, yeah, I think it's a real good example of meekness. Uh, you know, so anyway, it, it, uh, it, it's just like I was saying the other day about the the fruits of the spirit you cannot i mean you can be diligent to serve god you can study about it you can learn and understand the different fruits but your walk in god you're just you know god's going to help to help you develop and and walk uh but he's the only one that's going to actually help you to have these fruits instilled in your life that you're actually your your character produces love joy peace long suffering gentleness meekness you know that 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 these these um, fruits of 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 the inner man it's not just it's it's a fruit of the spirit of god but it's the spirit of god that you've been born of that becomes you as an individual in spiritually, you've been born into a different person. You become a new creature, Paul said. 
Uh, and so, and God's creating that righteousness in that creature. Like I said before to Sister Thursday night, to Sister McNabb, I believe it was, said some people say, we got the Holy Ghost, so we've got all we need. We can make perfection if you got the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I said, no. When you get the Holy Ghost, you're just a baby. But you don't have a mind, which is the vehicle for that Holy Ghost nature, that inward man, for that man to, to manifest, or, or uh, it's got to have a mind, and that mind's going to have to be righteous. And that's what God is instilling in all of us, is, is the character of righteousness, true righteousness in all that we do. That's perfection. Uh, but but we can't just make up our mind. You know, I wish I could just make up my mind. Well, I don't know if I really do or not, just to be honest, because, I mean, how can I make up my mind that I'm going to be righteous tomorrow or even the rest of the day? I, you, I mean, you, if you say that before dark, you'll be in the same place Peter was. You'll find out you can't do it. You can't come up with what you what you aren't. But God's going to have to develop that in you. And that's why you just have to be humble enough and, and, and ask God to help you with that kind of humility that, that you can just serve him and stay dedicated to him and let him work out the consequences. Whatever the consequences comes for you living a dedicated, faithful life to God, you can't lose at that game. I'll tell you that you won't lose, and there and 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 you'll lose at everything else. Anything else you try to do outside of God, you're going to lose. You're going to lose life. You're going to lose joy. You're going to probably die sick in your heart, if not in your body, both. And so. I'm in this to win, aren't you? Praise God. All right. Well, I, I don't like, I mean, I'm glad we can have these kind of Zoom meetings that are uh, better than not having any kind of gathering together or not having any of the word of God, but, but I, it certainly don't take place of physical gathering together. And so, Let's all pray that we will be able to get back together next Sunday. And let me, I don't have to say this, but, but just in case there might be one person, y'all are all such good givers. You don't need to talk too much about it. But we haven't had an offering in last Sunday or this Sunday. Son, yes. And so Sister Durham's probably worried about how she's going to pay bills next week. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so don't spend your tithes and offerings. Just hang on to it. And if you, if it gets to burning in your hands, we'll run by the church and drop it in the in the drop there in my office. And I'll sit your girl and check on it, make sure she gets it. Uh, but anyway, our bills keep going on no matter what happens. Praise God. All right, unless somebody has something else, we'll. Let's all turn on our microphones and just give the Lord a praise before we close here today. Brother Smith. Yes. I just wanted to say it was so good to see uh, Sister Donna's grandson. I know she's been praying about him being able to come to church. And so as much as I per personally don't love Zooms, um, which is why I'm not ever on the video, but um, it was good to see his face. And so it's kind of a answered prayer there. So I just wanted to... Uh, say hi to Gage, um, Donna's grandson, who she's been praying about coming to church. Yes. Yeah. Thanks for mentioning that. Yeah. I did see his face there a few times. They're evidently over at Sister Nona's. Either that or I'm sure that's what they're, where they're at. But anyway, we're glad. I'm so glad to, to see them. All right. Let's, uh, let's, uh, uh
turn our microphones on. Give the Lord a praise here before we pray. Thank you. Praise your wonderful name. Thank you for your precious. Thank you for God. Watch over your people, Lord Jesus. Our trust and our people that you Help us with this agape and family. It's really spiritual. Of this world, the love of mankind, that it comes from the throne of heaven. Hallelujah. Thank you. Lamb of God, help us to love like you do, Jesus, like your Father does. We give you praise today. Oh, Lamb of God, thank you for your goodness. Thank you. Amen. Amen. All right, everybody. God bless you. Have a good God bless uh, you all. day and have a good week this week. Hey, I'll see some of you, brother, Seven next five. Saturday. Uh, but we'll see you Thursday night okay. on the Zoom meeting and then we'll see where we're at. Okay. Yeah, we didn't see you, Sister Elsie, but we did see your, your black hair out the side of the corner. I saw there you see, there it is. Anyway, all right. God bless you all. I'll post a recording on on WhatsApp.